Nicotine is an interesting compound. It will raise blood pressure and it um, is probably not safe for everybody. But, you know, the nicotine is gaining in popularity like crazy, mainly these um, pouches that people put in the lip. Not, we're not talking about um, smoking, vaping, dipping, or snuffing. You know, my interest in nicotine started, this was in 2010. I was visiting Columbia Medical School and I was in the office of the great neurobiologist Richard Axel won the Nobel Prize, co-recipient with Linda Buck for the um, discovery of the molecular basis of olfaction. Brilliant guy. He's probably in his late seventies now, probably. Yeah, and he kept popping Nicorette in his mouth, mm -hmm. and I was like, "What's this about?" And he said, "Oh, well, this was just anecdote, right?" But he said, "But he said this. He said, oh, well, you know, it protects against Parkinson's and Alzheimer's.'" I said, "It does." And he goes, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." I don't know if he was kidding or not. He's known for making jokes. And then he said that when he used to smoke, it really helped his focus and creativity, but then he quit smoking because he didn't want lung cancer and he found that he couldn't focus as well, so he would choose Nicorette. So occasionally, like right now, we'll each, I do a half a piece, but I'm not Russian. So I'm a little, you know, you know did you just pop the whole thing in your mouth? Mm -hmm. So I'll do a couple milligrams every now and again. And it, Definitely sharpens the mind on an empty stomach in particular, but you fast all day. You're still doing one meal a day? One meal a day. Yeah. Yeah, I did a nicotine pouch with Rogan at dinner and oh, I, I got high. Yeah, that's a lot. That's like usually six or eight milligrams. I know people that get a canister of Zin, take one a day, pretty soon they're taking a canister a day. So you have to be very careful. I will only allow myself two pieces of Nicorette total per week. And you will notice that you know, in the day after you use it, you know, sometimes your your throat will feel a little bit like like a little spasmy, like you might want to cough once or twice. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you're a singer or you're a podcaster or something, you have to do long podcasts, you want to just be mindful of it. But yeah, you're supposed to kind of like keep it in your cheek and you know, here we go. But it did make me intensely focused mm -hmm. in a way that was a little bit scary because well, um, the nucleus basalis is in the, you know, in basal forebrain nucleus has cholinergic neurons that radiate out axons, little wires that release acetylcholine into the neocortex and elsewhere. And when you focus on one particular topic matter or one particular area of your visual field or listening to something and focusing visually, we know that there's a, an elaboration of the amount of acetylcholine released there and it binds to nicotinic acetylcholine receptor sites there. So it's a kind of an attentional modulation um, by acetylcholine. So you're getting it with nicotine, you're getting a exogenous or artificial heightening of that circuitry. And uh, the time I had Tucker Carlson on the podcast, he told me that apparently it uh, helps him, as he said publicly, uh, keep his uh, love life vibrant. Really? It causes vasoconstriction. Like he literally said, it makes his dick really hard. He said that publicly also. Okay. Well, as little as I want to think about Tucker Carlson's Trust um, sex life, um, no disrespect. Uh, the major effect of nicotine on the vasculature, my understanding is that it causes vasoconstriction, not vasodilation. Drugs like Cialis, Tadalafil, Viagra, et cetera, are vasodilators. They allow more blood flow. Um, uh, nicotine does the opposite, less blood flow to the periphery, but provided dosages are kept low. And I, I don't recommend people use it frequently or at all. And I don't recommend young people use it, you know, um, you know, 25 and younger, brain's very plastic at that time. And um, and certainly smoking, dipping, vaping and snuffing aren't good because you're gonna run into, you run into trouble uh, for other reasons. But in any case, um, well, and even there, vaping is a controversial topic. It's probably safer than smoking, but has its own issues. And I said something like that, and boy, did I catch a lot of heat for that. You can't say anything as a health science educator, not piss somebody off. You know, it just depends on where the, the center of mass is and how far outside that you are. For me, the caffeine is the main thing. And actually, it's a, it's a really big part of my life. And one of the things you recommend that people wait a bit in the morning to, oh, yeah. to consume caffeine. If they experience a crash in the afternoon. That this is one of the misconceptions I um, I regret <laughs> maybe even discussing it for people that crash in the afternoon. Oftentimes, if they delay their caffeine by 60 and 90 minutes in the morning, they will offset some of that. But if you eat a lunch that's too big or you didn't sleep well the night before, you're not gonna avoid that. 
afternoon crash. But I'll wake up sometimes and go straight to hydration, caffeine, especially if I'm gonna work out. Here's a weird one. If I exercise before 8.30 a.m., especially if I start exercising when I'm a little bit tired, I get energy that lasts all day. If I wait until my peak of energy, which is mid-morning, 10 a.m., 11 a.m., and I start exercising then, I'm basically exhausted all afternoon. And I don't understand why. I mean, it depends on the intensity of the workout. But So I like to be done, showered, and heading into work by 9 a.m., but I don't always meet that mark. So you're saying it doesn't affect your energy if you start uh, with exercising. I think you can get energy and wake yourself up with exercise if you start early. And it, and then that fuels you all day long. I think that if you wait until you're feeling at your best mm -hmm. to train, sometimes that's detrimental because then in the afternoon when you're doing like the work we get paid for, like research, podcasting, et cetera, then oftentimes you know, your your brain isn't firing as well. That's interesting. I haven't really rigorously tried that, wake up and just start running or listening. This is the Jocko thing. And then there's this phenomenon called entrainment, where if you force yourself to exercise or eat or socialize or view bright light at a certain time of day for three to seven days in a row, pretty soon there's an anticipatory circuit that gets generated. This is why anyone in theory can become a morning person to some degree or another. And this is also a beautiful example of why you wake up before your alarm clock goes off. You know, people wake up and all of a sudden it goes off. It wasn't because it clicked. It's because you have this in incredible timekeeping mechanism that exists in sleep. And there's some papers that have been published in the last couple of years, Nature Neuroscience and elsewhere, showing that people can answer math problems in their sleep, simple math problems, but math problems nonetheless.